The IRA in the United States is hundreds of billions of dollars uh, of uh, support to investments to draw uh, people into the United States and to draw investors into the United States. Um, the Canadian economy can't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with that on a global overall scale. But we can be very, and we have been very strategic about where we want to step up and compete directly. The cars of the future will be made right here in Ontario from start to finish, from mines to manufacturing by Ontario workers. VW is coming to Canada with a big price tag. The German auto giant will build a massive electric vehicle battery plant in St. Thomas, Ontario. The government's saying it will create 3,000 direct jobs and another 30,000 indirect ones. Construction will start in 2024 with the plant ready for production in 2027. The cost? VW is spending $7 billion. The federal government is investing $700 million and putting up to 13 billion more in subsidies over a decade. And the Ontario government is giving 500 million and then what they say will be hundreds of millions more in infrastructure. So is that the cost of doing business? How much business can Canada afford to do? Let's take this to our panel of strategists. Greg McCachran has advised politicians at all three levels of government and worked on the communications team for two national election campaigns. Greg leans liberal. Fred Delore is the former director of political operations for Prime Minister Stephen Harper and was the 2021 Conservative National Campaign Manager. He is now a managing partner with Deloria Public Affairs and Anne McGrath is National Director of the NDP. Hello Friday Strats, good to have you in the studio and I want to start with you because you know 13 billion dollars of taxpayers money towards Volkswagen, a deal with Volkswagen. I like would you consider this corporate subsidies because NDP leader Jagmeet Singh talks a lot about corporate greed. Is this a good deal for Canadians? Well, I mean, I think you can look at it a number of ways. Uh, I, uh, today, because, it, you know, we're, we're hearing what the number is, we heard about the deal, but then the number was not that's readily right. available. Yeah. So we finally now know what the numbers are. Uh, if uh, if this deal and these numbers are an invest are going to be an investment, then it does have to be in good paying union jobs and uh, uh, benefits to the community and in particular uh, uh, action on climate change. It is in many ways it's a response to the Inflation Reduction uh, Act in the United States. And so I think it, 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 it is a welcome news if it uh, pans out the way that it's being uh, promoted today. But, you know, I, I saw the sign uh, on the Prime Minister and, and the Premier's podium that talked about it as being an investment in good jobs. Good jobs means that they have to allow for those to be unionized jobs with good pay yeah. long term. They can't pull out after, you know, a couple of years. So I'm hoping that the federal government was smart enough to get a bunch of things in writing. And, and the prime, prime Minister really today seemed to intimating that they would be because that's what Joe Biden in the States is trying to do. In other words, they have to be unionized jobs first. But Fred, so how does Conservative leader Pierre Poilievre play this? This money th is going in a federal riding, a federal uh, 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 riding. The mayor is a former federal MP, and the premier of Ontario, another conservative, is very enthusiastic about it. So a lot of conservatives here that are super enthusiastic about it. So how does Pierre Poilievre try to, you know, see sort of poke a needle in that balloon? Right, well, they have to balance different uh, objectives. You do have the, the Premier who is, sees this as a very strong investment. It's going to build the largest Volkswagen gigafactory in the world here in Canada, lead to uh, tens of thousands of jobs, hundreds of billions of dollars of, uh, of, uh, of economic growth. But on Mr. Poliev's side of things, you know, he is planning to be Prime Minister in a few years. We have out of control federal spending. He has to cut somewhere. Funding has to be cut. Can't just cut dental care and child care. You have to cut other items. And this is going to be some of the things we're going to be seeing tight, tight purse strings when Poliev is Prime Minister. He even wrote to the uh, federal budget watchdog to make sure that this money was going to be well spent. But it's going to be hard for them to, to, to sort of throw shade on this project because a lot of 
conservatives. It's a conservative riding. They're going to get a huge windfall. But, Greg, so it's a huge announcement very good for for Ontario very good apparently for everybody and for Canada 13 billion dollars this as the public service is picketing and asking for increases in salary work from home how is the government going to refuse that without looking like it, like it caved in to union demands well, it's very separate for the reasons that Ann has stated. You know, the Biden government introduced the IRA. We talked about this a couple yeah. of weeks ago prior to the um, uh, to, to Minister Freeland bringing down her budget. So this is the new reality that Canada has to deal with. And I think you've laid it out you know, pretty clearly about St. Thomas. St. Thomas lost two major auto manufacturing plants following the 2008 yeah. um, uh, downturn in the economy to the recession. Um, as you said, the mayor of St. Thomas, former MP Karen Vecchio, the current MP, worked for All him. All conservatives, yeah. Worked for him in his in his office. The provincial representative is a member of uh, Doug Ford's caucus, and we saw Doug Ford there, front and center, and Vic Fideli getting lots of praise for doing this. Um, Pierre Poliver has written the the PBO, the Parliamentary Budget Officer, yeah. about this. Not his critic for finance, not his critic for industry. Yeah. So this is obviously... This is the latter. <laughs> this is obviously a communications tool. And Fred kind of alluded that this may be a place that they they cut. You might be in an election ad in a couple of weeks, buddy. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, I think, would go over extremely poorly in St. Thomas. And if he was sincere... I think the leader of the opposition should then have also written the Auditor General of Ontario and asked about the $500 million that the province is putting in. If this is not a political game, then you would be mad at all the money going in this, not just the ones from the Liberal Prime Minister. You want to, res want to respond to that? I mean, he did write to the, to the, to the budget watchdog, the federal one. Um, he is looking into that investment. It, but it still is difficult for him to poke holes in it. I mean, the ND, it's a, it has the support of the NDP. Pete has the support of the federal conservatives and you know his own MP can't go around from the area Karen Vecchio can't go around brag about it say hey look at what a great windfall it leaves him in a weird position doesn't it it does he's in a strange pickle here where how do you how do you balance this and these are really they, they look like really good high-paying private sector jobs that this will be creating it seems to be a fantastic investment but if you want to uh, run on a uh, platform eventually to cut a lot of the federal spending, uh, this is a massive, massive expenditure at the same time. So this is the balance he's going to have to figure out and how he gets through that, I don't know. He, he well, may I, even inherit the project eh, because there will be an election right. before that's the right. project is Absolutely. over. Absolutely. Right. So while these subsidies are coming through, he may cancel the check halfway yeah. through all this and then what happens? No. And he wants to portray himself as some kind of a working class hero that supports unions right. and thinks that these things are really important. He, that is, that is a dilemma for him there's no question if he opposes this he is opposing yeah. well-paid private sector hopefully unionized jobs well I, I, I want to ask you this because the the public sector uh, uh, people are asking for remote work or work from home or whatever you want to call it to be entrenched in their collective agreement should working remotely become a right in Canada well, it certainly beca it became very, it was very dominant, obviously, during the, the pandemic. I think for me, the most interesting thing about the Public S Service uh, Alliance and, and their strike is that they are trying to um, get wages that meet the cost of inflation. So, you know, I think it was Greg uh, or Fred talked about the, the, the link between, you know, this investment and the negotiations yes. with, the, with the public sector unions. I think if they can afford to put 13 billion dollars into this they can afford to pay their own workers uh, appropriately and 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 the public sector it looks to me is you know, I mean, I'm not at the bargaining table, but it sounds to me like what they're asking for is cost of living. They've gone two years without a contract, while which means that they have lost wages over that period of time, and they're asking for inflation. They're asking for the cost of living. Fred, uh, the, one of the the best clips I heard this week is a young woman saying, "So they want to work from home and they want more money," and she went, "Well, I want to work from home and I want more money too." So, is is it is it fair? Is it is that where 
Is that uh, what I, I, should be the reality in Canada post-pandemic? I, I think we have a really out-of-touch union here that is striking at the absolute worst time on issues that are really out of touch with Canadians. Um, people are are struggling. They're trying to get back to work. They're trying to. They're dealing with inflation uh, on a global scale, and then we have this um, the, the public service uh, complaining a lot about st perks that a lot of people don't have. So I think it's really bad timing. But, uh, they, on that but, they, but they deserve. Don't don't they deserve? A an increase. Yeah, and again, like this is where unions need to stop communicating like it's the 1990s. <laughs> when I hear that these people are making forty to sixty thousand dollars, then and in this city where you can't rely on our light rail to get you to work and you can't afford to live downtown, that resonates. But the work from home thing, a lot of private sector has been dealing with this since November, some sort of hybrid. Um, I'll just you know for your viewers. Local TV, local newspapers, Bruce Dickman, who is a columnist for the Ottawa Citizen, you know, was around the picket lines and he talked to a lot of people that were on strike going, we know Canadians are not fully on side with us. And I think that's why um, your co comments about the union leadership notwithstanding, I think so far the rhetoric has been kept to a minimum and yeah. it does sound like you know they are trying to work on things and I think it's just respective of you know people after three years of the pandemic wishing that they had the job security that you know others in Canada do. Yeah. Although I will say that I have never heard a conservative commentator uh, say that it's the right time for a strike. Yeah, <laughs> ever? <laughs> ever. Too sure, too sure. Well, they, at least they're coherent. Yeah.